A keystone species is one which is essential to the functioning of the ecosystem as a whole. Keystone species are the biological foundation that support the entire interdependent network of life. They're the ones that many other animals simply can't do without. Without them, the ecosystem would unravel. In British Columbia, the Pacific salmon are the keystone species. Each summer, millions of fish return to this coast to fill hundreds of streams and rivers just as they have for thousands of years. Feeding hundreds of species, including the local people, the First Nations, the ecosystems, and many of the local economies. Salmon have fundamentally shaped life on the coast. Yet quietly and without explanation, the numbers of salmon in BC are steadily dwindling. Many rivers are already on the edge of extinction. Here, in the world's largest sockeye salmon river, millions of fish are going missing. And many of the few that do make it back to the rivers are dying mysteriously before they have a chance to lay their eggs. Biologist Alex Morton has been following and studying the unusual decline. Full of eggs, eh? This is strange. You know, we're right on the spawning grounds. This fish has made the whole trip, but she never spawned. She never released those precious eggs. And we're seeing a lot of this. Uh, most of these fish look like they haven't spawned. This pre-spawn mortality is epidemic in the Fraser River. So we're trying to figure out why. The disappearing wild salmon is no small concern. Without them, BC will lose its most iconic species, as well as a culture, a way of life, and its most valuable natural food resource. The race is on to figure out what is happening to the iconic fish which built British Columbia before it's too late. Not so long ago, the Fraser River was the mightiest sockeye salmon river in the world. Hundreds of millions of salmon returned to the tributaries that branched into a vast network of hundreds of rivers and streams, totaling thousands of kilometers in length, that infiltrated the entire southern half of British Columbia with salmon. The mysterious decline in the productivity of the Fraser River sockeye began in the 1990s. With each passing year, the productivity continued to fall. This was blamed on many things. Perhaps the waters were too warm. Maybe the fish were starving out at sea. Perhaps it was overfishing. The Department of Fisheries closed the commercial sockeye salmon fishery, but even that didn't seem to help. Even without the pressure of commercial fishing, the numbers of returning salmon continued to plummet. Something was very wrong. Alex Morton has been working as a biologist in the remote wilderness of the British Columbian coast for over 30 years, watching and studying the decline of BC's wild salmon. This is the problem. This, this farm is just pouring out disease and pathogens, and our wild fish are swimming through it. I know, I've seen with my own eyes what happens to them when they go by. When industrial fish farms moved into her neighborhood, it soon became apparent they were having impacts on the wild fish. The most obvious symptom was a dramatic rise in parasitic sea lice on the tiny juvenile wild salmon, who don't naturally carry the lice. And sea lice aren't the only problem, but you know when these fish have lice on them from the farms, that they're also being exposed to whatever bacteria and viruses are on these farms at the same time. The salmon farm or salmon feedlot is a, a whole different situation. It breaks the natural laws that make salmon move. So they hold 600,000 to over a million fish stationary in one place. This amplifies the waste, but also most seriously, the pathogens. Because it's so easy for viruses and bacteria to jump fish to fish, to mutate, and then explode out of the farm in a billowing cloud. This is the major 
wild salmon migration route in British Columbia. That's where they put the salmon farms. They're clustered in these little narrow channels. Now, when one of these farms has a disease outbreak, so many viruses come out of the farm that they actually fill the entire channel. And then here come the Fraser sockeye, and they go through this channel and they come out the other end. And when the fish go on, they're contaminated, without a doubt, with whatever is coming out of those farms. So if we just look at the timing of the situation, the Fraser sockeye began to decline in the early 1990s at exactly the time that the salmon feedlots were put onto their migration route. The one run that is not declining is never found in those salmon farms and appears to be going around the southern end of Vancouver Island, and those are the Harrison sockeye, and they have been increasing over the same time period. Is it a coincidence that the only sockeye that are doing well are the ones that are not passing close to the salmon farms? The Department of Fisheries and Oceans, otherwise known as DFO, is the agency responsible for the protection of fish in Canada. In 2006, DFO tasked one of their employees, Dr. Christy Miller, to look into the disappearance of the Fraser fish. Dr. Miller heads up a cutting edge research lab, which uses an emerging science called genomic profiling, which gives scientists an unprecedented insight into the life history of a salmon. Dr. Christy Miller, her work, genomic profiling, the way I see it is she makes the fish talk. She, it's like sitting a fish down in the office and saying, how are you feeling? So in all our bodies, we've got these switches that turn on and off in our cells, depending on how, what kind of experience we're having with life. And she found that the ones that died before they spawned had all these switches flicked in their cells, and the ones that lived had a whole different pattern of switches. So she's like, okay, so the ones that are dying seem to be dying of the same thing. Well, that was huge because all the other scientists that tried to figure this out were like, uh, God, they're dying of everything, you know? They, they couldn't figure it out. And um, when she read these switches, they were like leukemia, retrovirus, brain tumor, immune system decay. Um, and she looked at that and went, uh, salmon leukemia. Salmon leukemia is this virus that raged through the salmon farming industry right at the beginning when it went into the Campbell River area in the early 90s. The salmon leukemia virus attacks their immune system, so they die of something else. It's a retrovirus like AIDS. And DFO wrote about six papers on it, and they found that virtually all of the Chinook farms were infected and that this virus killed 100% of the sockeye salmon that were exposed to it and they never did anything about it. And as soon as Dr. Miller's work, you know, her compass was all over the place. As soon as her compass pointed at salmon farms, she wasn't allowed to go to meetings. Uh, she wasn't allowed to talk to the media even when she published in the Journal of Science. The world's most prestigious scientific journal, Science, published Dr. Christy Miller's findings in January of 2011. It was hailed as some of the most significant new salmon research in a decade. Hundreds of reporters lined up to interview Miller about her findings, but they were all turned away. Dr. Christy Miller is head of molecular science for DFO, one of the top scientists on the West Coast. And when we learned that she had a paper coming out in, in one of the leading journals, uh, there was a lot of interest in, in the media in talking to her. I asked for an, an interview time to be set up, never heard back. So go back to DFO and ask what's going on, and there's met with this kind of wall of silence. There's no question that the federal government, with orders from Ottawa, uh, muzzled her and kept her from, from speaking about a science paper which had been published. It's pretty disturbing, I think, when the government starts to mess around with science. It starts to try and shape the picture and try and um, control science in a way like that. I mean, Muslim scientists is not something that should be happening in a, in a great democracy. There were questions about whether or not she'd get funding for continued research. Unfortunately, uh, I guess I can't phone her up and ask her because she can't talk. 
Dr. Miller, when she began to uh, see a, a strong correlation between these dying sockeye and the salmon leukemia virus, and she read that the salmon leukemia virus was in the salmon farms, she naturally wanted to go test those fish. So in April of 2010, she made a request to DFO to test farm salmon for this virus, but access was denied. She was not allowed to test these fish that are in public waters, uh, releasing their pathogens into the most valuable salmon stocks in this country. And she was not allowed to follow the trail into the pens. To protect the interests of the salmon farming industry, the government allows the farms to keep their disease information confidential from the public and from scientists. There is no way to find out what diseases are on the farms. Uh, the fact that the farms won't allow it is pretty suggestive to me. <laughs> um, they're afraid of what will be found. Uh, if they were you know, not concerned, as they claim to be, then they would surely open up their farms and say, come in and test because we're proud of our product and you won't find any issues. Clearly, they, they know that there are issues and they're not allowing testing for that reason. In 2009, fishermen were getting ready for a good run to return to the Fraser River. An estimated 130 million young salmon had left the river in 2007 and were now due to return as adults. 13 million adult sockeye were predicted to return. All signs look good. However, instead of being a banner year, it turned out to be the worst in recorded history. Over 10 million fish vanished without a trace. It was an unexpected disaster. The fishing boats stayed tied to the docks and thousands went without their traditional food supply. The government responded to the public outcry by announcing a federal inquiry into the decline. It was called the Cohen Commission. It was the first ever federal inquiry we've had on any fish species in Canada. We never had a commission on, on the collapse of cod, and uh, that was a huge loss to Canada and, and to the world. Uh, we should have learned a lot of lessons on that. The $26 million inquiry included 150 days of hearings. Many theories were presented about why the fish might be disappearing. Items on the table included overfishing, sharks, water temperature, pollution, and even predatory giant squid. It wasn't until the final days that the inquiry turned its attention to salmon farms. Uh, Dr. Fleming, and I'm very interested in your Norwegian experience. As I understand uh, your evidence, in Norway, uh, the government, in its wisdom, has seen fit to recognize that certain uh, fishing rivers or migratory routes for fish are uh, important enough that they should keep salmon farms off of them? Uh, that's correct. And so, does that mean the government recognizes a risk to wild fish from fish farms? Uh, yes, there are official statements to that fact. One of those risks is the risks of disease transmission? Uh, yes. The wonder of the Cohen Commission is that they could put senior bureaucrats on the stand who had to be examined, which is not a place they commonly exist. And they were very uncomfortable with that. The possibility of disease affecting the wild sockeye runs has never been a factor for BC in terms of a siting decision. Is that fair? That's a fair comment, isn't it? I couldn't really say because... What about you, Mr. Swartfigur? Can you think of a site that's ever been rejected by the federal government because of its impacts on wild salmon migratory routes? No, I can't. At least 10 fish farms approved right in the narrowest channel of dis the Discovery Passage, the narrowest place the wild salmon migrate through. Was that risk considered when they were approved? Wild fish get infections. I'm no expert in fish health, but I th uh, my, uh, my belief is wild fish get infections, whether uh, as part of a natural course of fish being in the natural environment. TFO, are they in a conflict of interest? Yeah, I think they're in a serious conflict of interest. They have to, by their mandate, they're supposed to protect wild fish, and, and uh, by their political masters, they're supposed to uh, support the development of an agriculture industry. 
In the final days of the inquiry, Justice Cohen called on DFO's Dr. Christy Miller to testify about her findings. For the first time, the public would have a chance to hear Miller speak about her discovery since her gag order had been imposed. What you found is some sort of new virus. Your leading suspect was uh, salmon leukemia virus. Yes, it was. And if in fact that's the case, this in fact may be the smoking gun for the 2009 declines. It could be the smoking gun. She's doing some fantastic work under very difficult conditions and, uh, you know, in, in conditions where she says she's been intimidated by her managers for reporting on health issues around wild salmon. She felt uh, intimidated about the potential loss of her data if she went public. She felt intimidated uh, in terms of her budget. And so that was extremely revealing. So while all this was happening, um, Dr. Rick Rutledge was very worried about the river's inlet sockeye because they were in an unexplained decline, a lot like the Fraser sockeye. I had no idea as to why the numbers were so low. I tried to think as the season was winding down what on earth the cause might be. It had to be something new, I thought, because it hadn't happened before as far as I could tell. So I eventually sent some samples in for testing. I remember when he called me, it was a, a dark October night, and he said to me, you know, Alex, are you sitting down? It was like he was gonna tell me that someone we knew had died. And he said, the tests came back positive for ISA virus in Rivers Inlet smolts. I was devastated. <laughs> yeah, I thought, okay, 20 years of trying to prevent this industry from destroying the wild salmon of Canada, and I have failed. Salmon influenza, ISA virus. Most lethal known salmon virus worldwide caused $2 billion worth of damage in Chile. Um, no country wants it. It has spread everywhere in the world where Atlantic salmon are being raised in pens in large numbers by the Norwegian companies. ISA, infectious salmon anemia, the most lethal known salmon virus worldwide. It was first detected in Norway in 1984. At first, the virus seemed benign. But once it incubated in the salmon farms, it mutated into highly virulent and lethal strains, which can kill millions of fish at a time. These deadly strains of ISA spread to new countries by way of egg imports. The industry farms mainly Atlantic salmon, so they must import Atlantic salmon eggs from Europe into the country in which they are operating their farms. When the ISA virus wiped out 70% of Chile's salmon industry, the strain was traced back to Norway. The difference between Chile and BC, though, is that Chile has no native salmon, whereas BC has much to lose, with thousands of runs of five different species of Pacific salmon and entire ecosystems and economies that depend on them. The ISA is sometimes called salmon flu, and so it, it is a bit flu-like, I guess, in its symptoms. Um, but it's like a very, very severe flu, you know, like the, the type that killed millions of people uh, after the First World War. I mean, it's a, it's a very serious flu to which the fish may not be adapted at all. Um, and incidentally, it was that crowding of people into high densities during training camps and so forth and in the trenches in Europe that led to the... Uh, evolution of an extremely virulent form of, of flu virus that killed millions upon millions of people. ISA is like mad cow disease in terms of shutting borders, closing farms. ISA is so important that it's an internationally reportable disease. Most salmon diseases are not, but any country, there's a website you can go to and any country that has it is supposed to be reporting it and it's up there. ISA caused $2 billion of damage in Chile when it hit down there, when uh, European ISA ended up in Chile. Nobody knows what happens when you introduce a virus into a, into a population that hasn't been exposed to it before. It, it might be totally benign, or it might have a devastating impact like smallpox had in the Aboriginal populations in North America or the, the uh, bubonic plague had in Europe. This is something I thought we were we were working to prevent coming into British Columbia. 
but uh, my first response was get out in the rivers. Let's see, let's have a look around. Let's see where this is. It's the same thing I did when the sea lice, when I found the sea lice in 2001. I just made a net and just went around and started looking at all the fish. Because if you just sit there with that bad news, it, it, it destroys you. Uh, but if you can get out and do something, it, it's a lot healthier. It was late in the season, most of the salmon were already in the river, but we dashed down to the lower Fraser River because we had been getting reports from people down there that there was a massive number of, of salmon dying in the river without spawning. And this uh, big yellow Chinook salmon, uh, a white Harrison Spring, that had ISA virus. This sockeye had ISA virus. This coho had ISA virus. We tested 11 fish in the Fraser River, a, a, a river of millions and we got it three times. It was European strain ISA virus. Alex uh, didn't fool around. I mean, she sent, she decided to send her samples to the lab in Prince Edward Island that is recognized by the World Health Organization as being one of two labs in the world that are entitled to test for ISA with international significance. She also sent it to Dr. Nyland in Norway, who's the leading expert on ISA in the world. So she, she sent these samples to the two people who were the most credible international folks. We gave a press conference. We thought the scientific community should be given the opportunity to engage on this and really figure this out. But <laughs> really all hell broke loose when we did that. The CFIA came and took our samples and said they were going to run tests, and we were supportive of that. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency contacted me and asked me to turn over all my samples, which I did. They shipped them to the testing lab in Moncton, and uh, they tested them for uh, the remaining samples for the infectious salmon anemia virus. Very quickly thereafter, the CFIA gave a press release as well. The Minister of Fisheries came out and said that all of them were negative, that, that our results were completely wrong. They did a press release basically to refute our findings, to say that there was no problem, there was no ISA. They said everything was negative. I was, I was surprised, and I'm, I'm distressed about it. I, this is a serious matter, and, it, and the government is not taking it sufficiently seriously in my mind. We were standing on a riverbank, actually, listening to it on our cell phones, and I kept waiting for them to address the whole issue, what was hap happening in the Fraser River, what we had found down there. Um, when they kept talking about the ISA findings, they, they fixated on the river's inlet. They never talked about the ISA findings we had in the Fraser River. And with the, the case of the river's inlet sake, those samples were degraded because they hadn't been stored properly. But in the case of the Fraser River samples, these were fresh samples, and they never mentioned them. The minister never mentioned them. They just, they, they treated us like we didn't exist, like this work was not going on. I had been allowed to look at all the Cohen documents prior to this time. I was a participant, a legal participant, and, and, and reading their emails, they were fighting us. Uh, not trying to protect us. This is an internal CFIA email from Joseph Bears to a whole list of people. It says, Khan, it's clear that we're turning the PR tide to our favor. And this is because of the very successful performance of our spokes at the technical briefing yesterday. You, Stephen, Peter, and Paul were a terrific team, indeed. Congratulations. One battle is won. Now we have to nail the surveillance piece and we will win the war also. Oh, what war? What, the war against us, the public? <laughs> uh, Khan, who's Cornelius Keeley, comes back and he says, hey, concentrate on the headlines. That's often all people read or remember. <laughs> it's just, it really, you know, um, these are the same guys looking after H1N1 and mad cow disease. It really does concern me. 
How dangerous is the ISA virus? I think a measure of that is the fact that Justice Cohen reopened the entire inquiry. The lawyers had gone home. The, the rental of the room was over. You know, everybody was just in the right up the report mode. And he reopened the whole inquiry just before Christmas. All labs that had tested for the ISA virus were invited to speak at the Cohen Commission's ISA hearings. Dr. Fred Kibenji, based on Prince Edward Island, heads up one of only two world reference labs for ISA. Dr. Art Nyland from Norway, considered to be one of the world's experts on ISA. Dr. Christy Miller, head of the genomics lab for DFO. And Dr. Nelly Gagne, DFO's reference lab and the lab used by the CFIA to test for ISA. When Nell Gagne, who did the test for them, actually went on the stand, she said she had gotten weak positives, and for her, the results were inconclusive. Were your RT-PCR results inconclusive? We reported them as inconclusive, and in this case, all samples submitted showed extensive to total degradation of RNA. And the problem was the samples were so degraded. You know, now, a year after tracking viruses, I am amazed that we got an ISA hit at all in those samples. They were in a household freezer for months. It's not a negative. So for the federal government to come out and say all the results, test results were negative uh, was uh, not correct. The hearings then turned to the fresher samples that had been tested by the four different labs. Dr. Nyland, uh I'll turn my next set of questions to the testing that you've done. I understand you've tested several batches. What were your results? Did you obtain any positive RT-PCR tests for ISAV in those samples that you tested? Among the first 48, I had uh, one positive. In that testing, we found two positive samples out of 48. We did indeed obtain um, ISA sequence. There's uh, only one lab that didn't find it, and that was the reference lab from DFO in Moncton. And, uh, you know, it turns out they were sampling a totally different segment from everyone else who actually found the ISA virus. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we've well, got three or four labs that are finding it, and one that's a government lab that's not. You know, you have to uh, pause and, and uh, wonder what's going on, whether they really do want to find it or not. We learned that Dr. Miller was prohibited by DFO from testing for ISA virus, but a salmon farm came to her, and their fish were turning yellow and dying, and they couldn't figure out why. And she decided to test them for ISA virus, even though she was instructed not to. She wanted to get to the bottom of it. And we did um, identify some positive ISA fish among their fish. Uh, it was decided that we should contact Ottawa about this. And um, so Stephen Stevens in Ottawa was contacted. And we basically told um, them the results that we had. I, I don't think that... Uh, that um, Stephen Stevens in Ottawa was very pleased that we were doing this testing. Basically, there, there, there was a general feeling that as a scientist, I should not be undertaking research on something um, if I didn't understand the ramifications of, of what the results could, could do. Everyone who's reported the virus has suffered a consequence. Uh, Kabenge got his lab audited. Um, Dr. Neeland had a, an ethics challenge against him. Dr. Miller gets muzzled as soon as her work takes her towards the fish farm viruses. Um, everyone who tries to speak up about these viruses gets shut up in some way. Three leading labs around the world, and including DFO's own lab in Nanaimo, had found ISA. And CFIA's response was to attack those labs. They went in uh, to Dr. Kabenji's lab and tried to attack Dr. Kabenji's credibility and the credibility of his lab 
and to use all of the mechanisms of government that they could do. Any positive result is a difficult result. People don't easily accept positive results, and the, the, the automatic reaction will be try to find some way of explaining it away in some form. So, yeah, that is always the case. It's always there as long as you come up with a positive result. But, you know, we are so confident in our work that we just cannot sweep it under the rug. So we are continuously testing, and once we find a positive result, we report it as it is. Dr. Kabenji had the temerity to announce positive test results, and the result, his lab is being analyzed by you. And Mr. Stephen, I suggest to you that the federal government is going to try and take away his OIE certification as a punishment for this. I predict within the next 12 months, Canada will go after his credibility. Isn't that right? I disagree. 11 months later, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency would attempt to strip Dr. Kabenji of his World Reference Lab status, citing results from an audit they had conducted on his lab. If Dr. Kabenji's test results are officially recognized, then BC would be internationally listed as positive for the ISA virus. But if the CFIA's attempt at suspending Dr. Kabenji's status are successful, then BC will remain listed as free of ISA, despite the numerous positive test results. What's happened in Canada is salmon disease has become a federal secret. And the reason we found out at the Cohen Commission is that if this flu virus is confirmed in British Columbia, they say the border is going to close for BC farm salmon to the US and China. Let's say we do find ISA uh, in BC and all of a sudden markets are closed, then there will be no trade, basically. <laughs> That's when a real aha went off in my mind. I'm like, oh, I totally get this now. You guys are hiding this because it's going to damage the industry. It was so transparent and clear. So, you know, this is where you can see the size of the thing that we're coming up against. This is international trade. Our tests are saying ISA virus is here. The province has told these trade partners that it's not here, and these fish are going over the border. Is this spreading ISA down the coast of California? Is this spreading ISA into Washington State? We don't know. They won't accept the results of any other lab than the Moncton lab. They know the Moncton lab uh, is incapable of finding it. The results have to be confirmed through our National Reference Laboratory. And my understanding as of this date, those, none of those tests, and as of this date today, none of those tests have ever been confirmed from our National Reference Laboratory. So there is no evidence to support that ISA is occurring in either wild or cultured salmon in BC. Yes, there is no evidence to support that. Do you think ISA is here? Yes. Well, certainly ISA is here. I clearly believe that there is a, a, a virus here that is very similar to ISA virus in, in, in Europe. There have just been so many positive tests from, from different labs. The sequences that we have detected in samples from British Columbia have all been of European genotype. And so that gives me a pretty high level of confidence along with all the tests I do every day, that we do not have ISA virus in British Columbia. Dr. Gary Marty is the provincial health veterinarian for British Columbia. He is in charge of monitoring for diseases in both farmed salmon and wild salmon. I don't understand how Dr. Marty has not found it and these other scientists have. I simply don't understand that. Gary Marty is, is in a very difficult situation right now because if he reports that ISA is here, the industry that he works with is going to crumble. Shareholders probably don't know what's brewing here in British Columbia. So Dr. Marty is under enormous pressure right now because he is the only one that has had access to these fish and looking to them. So much hinges on what he says and sees. Now, when we have no evidence of disease, and PCR results that can't be confirmed, the best way to interpret those is that they are false positive test results. Yeah, these are Gary Marty's records. These are Gary Marty's records. 
these records are um, incidences when the fish farm companies came to Gary Marty and asked him to do specific tests on their fish. So um, here we have a case where Marine Harvest in 2009 submitted fish tissue and they want tests for ISA. Mortality has been increasing. And so in this report where they've asked for a test for ISA, he says, sinusoidal congestion is one of the classic lesions associated with ISA V infections. Okay, but look at this one here. Marine harvest, two days later, specific request for a test for ISA. ISA is not supposed to be here, but this company is familiar with, with ISA is asking for a test. Signed by Gary Marty. Yeah, what do you know, Gary Marty? Here you go. One day later, they again sent tissue for ISA test, marine harvest. It was not designed as a public document, so that's one of the unfortunate drawbacks of release of these records to the public. This is another one, I don't know what it means, but sampled four fresh morts with hot guts. Mortality increased over the last two days. You know, in the reports, Gary Marty does say he sees sign of ISA. To confirm the disease, you actually have to have sick fish that have signs in them that are consistent with the disease. But there you go, that's an ISA lesion, that's an ISA lesion. There's a fish that died of ISA lesions. ISA lesions, according to Gary Marty. There were 55 instances where I put in a diagnosis that was described as a classic lesion of the ISA virus. Right, so that's, that's a fact. But then what you do, we also had a specific PCR test that looked for the ISA virus. And all the tests have been negative consistently, no virus. You have to have sick fish, because if this disease were present here, it would be killing large numbers of fish. We're in the river and there's dying fish everywhere. People are very alarmed, particularly this year. Fish are vanishing, horsefly, lower shoe swap, rivers of the central coast. Um, we, we go into places and we see more dead fish than alive. Sometimes we can't even see an alive fish. All pre-spawn mortality. There's a lot of fish dying on this coast in the farms and in the rivers. There's definitely something going on. Um, a lot of the rivers we've seen, the fish are dying before they're laying their eggs and they're showing signs of disease. We've seen fish with all sorts of things going wrong with them, like big blisters on their side, and you cut them open and their whole stomach cavity is full of water and blood, and yellowing, pale gills, pale heart, um, lesions in the in stomach wall, like red blisters all on the inside of their stomach. Some of them, the flesh has got blisters throughout the whole fish. This, this yellow one, the gills are quite pale, like normal gills should be dark red and fairly clean. And the gills get really mucousy on a lot of these sick fish we've seen. Like you can see that it's just completely mucousy, which could be a sign of diseases like ISA as kind of a fish flu. So how does a fish breathe when they've got that much mucus on the outside of their gills? The, the most distinguishing feature is the really big pop eyes yellowy on the outside with lots and lots of little pinpricks of red all over the outside. The insides, I, not a vet, but I can tell something's wrong with that fish. That's sort of the spleen, but it's all conjoined into one big lump. It just starts bleeding out of the flesh, and then it's all throughout the, the, all, the meat, like you can see. Those little blisters are getting to the point that they're coming through the skin. All this bloody water liquid was in the belly. It's basically bled to death from the inside pinprick red blood spot seem to be associated with the more diseased, sick-looking fish. Uh, supposedly bloodshot on the inside of the belly is one of the symptoms of ISA, but we won't know until we actually get test results back what's causing it. Speckly red showing up all through on this one, heart starting to get those blisters all over it. So what disease is that bad that it can cause that? I'm not entirely sure, but hopefully we'll find out. It just goes on and on and on. 
things I've never seen before. They're sick. You can see one or two sick fish, but when you see half the fish or more than half the fish in a river, they look like they're definitely gonna die before they spawn. It's bad. And all these fish appear to be dead pre-spawn. The legs. So look at all the fish that are here. Look at them all. All dead, all pre-spawn. It's pretty obvious that there's something going on. If you've actually walked any of these rivers or gone fishing, um, I don't think they're all dying necessarily of the same thing, but they're definitely dying of disease. It's basically all over the province. There is some rivers that seem to be doing better than others, but yeah, the, it's province-wide. So, yeah, we definitely should be doing this work now. We should have been doing it for years. Um, it, we need to do something. The rivers are getting less and less fish, and right now people are doing basically nothing. The government's sure not doing it, so mm -hmm. somebody's got to do it. And within, what, 15 minutes, we found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, just in a tiny section of river, pre-spawn mortality. I haven't seen one that spawned. Have you seen one? Zero. Not one. Viruses are delicate. You gotta get them in cool right away and keep them fresh and... That's why we work so fast. Oh, he's got that uh, columaris. Yes. It is a huge challenge to get these samples to the labs in time, and we need a we need a lab in British Columbia. It's ridiculous. I'm not allowed to use the labs at DFO. I'm not even allowed to talk to them. I mean, I'd like to drive to Nanaimo with these samples right now and put them in a negative 80 freezer in Dr. Miller's lab and have her look at them. She can do 200 fish a day for 40 pathogens. We're going to pin $200 on just this fish for three viruses. I mean, these fish are dying. They have a problem. We're willing to do the lead work and, and, and drive the samples right to the door. We're not even allowed to talk to them. We pay their salaries. These fish are dying out. So we ship them to Norway, which is expensive and time consuming and our, the quality of samples is damaged, but we're not gonna be stopped by closed doors. DFO does not wanna know what this fish died of. If I could track these viruses anywhere as I wanted, I'd go straight to the salmon farms and I'd look in those pens and I'd pick their sick looking fish and I would rush them to the labs, fresh tissue. Because the labs say the fresher, the better in a fish that's actually dying of the disease. Then, then your chance of being able to culture it is much greater. But you know we're not allowed to do that. So this whole search for the virus is being really slowed down. It's being impeded by the lack of ability to go to the farms and test. A friend came to me and he goes, you know, you realize there's Atlantic salmon in the supermarkets, but, you know, you could test them. It's like, of course, because the farms won't let us go near them. But there they are, lying fresh on ice. So we went shopping. We try to get the freshest one possible, so they have a date right on them, best before. You just gotta laugh, oh my God. You know, this is actually a food source. Um, long, skinny fish, it looks like a stick. A really fat fish that have like layers and layers of fat is abnormal, or rotting gills, or open sores, or the whole head is deformed. It's just like cut off, they have no nose. They're hilarious looking things. That's part of the problem with the farm is that a sick fish can continue to live because the predators aren't allowed to get at it. And uh, that's how disease spread is in the wild. A sick fish is taken out by a predator right away. 
end of, end of story for that fish, end of story for that pathogen. But in the farm situation, the fish stay alive until either they drop to the bottom and the mort divers go get them, or they're harvested like this and offered to the public uh, to eat. That's how you know, the viruses get a chance to reproduce, uh, spread fish to fish, and um, amplify in completely unnatural ways. I've seen a lot of fish in these supermarkets that I'm really shocked they're selling. If a person who fishes wild fish that sees something like this, or one of the ones with the lesions, or the red bleeding eyes, they would just throw them back. They would not eat them. But the people in the city don't know what a healthy fish is going to look like. And so they apparently buy them and eat them. But the thing about the skinny fish is that there's probably something wrong with them. You know, these guys are not eating. Were they sick? Sick fish do not eat, and fish that do not eat do not grow. Therefore, fish that make it, that grow and make it to market, the assumption is that they are not sick. They're also inspected by CFIA to ensure that they're healthy. So sick fish would not, fish that say are dying or extremely sick would not even be getting to the supermarket. He should come shopping with us because there's skinny fish all over. If a fish is not eating, it's usually sick. Or if there's a disease problem on the fish farm, I've been told that they stop feeding their fish. It's almost embarrassing that as a province that has, you know, wild salmon and all this beauty, people are coming here and they can actually buy that. It stinks. There's sores on it. It's, it's sick. It's skinny. You know, tails are gone. Faces are mutated. Does that represent this province? The first group of fish we bought, about 11 fish, three of them tested positive for ISA. We were shocked. We're getting ISA in the supermarkets. We went to Loblaws and said, where were these fish raised? And they said they were raised in British Columbia. So they admitted that these fish were from British Columbia. Um, I don't know what else to, to do other than keep testing keep testing. Uh, we go to Superstore a lot, TNT, um, Costco, uh, whoever sells farm salmon. And uh, we take tests and we send them off to these two labs and we ask them to look specifically for the European viruses. Um, so far we have found three, the ISA virus, we found the Piscine Rio virus, we've also found salmon alpha virus, which is causing uh, huge outbreaks. It's a pancreas disease in Norway, uh, very serious diseases. So are there any exotic viruses here that have been imported from to Europe? There are none that we know of. You know, this raises the point, every time someone buys one of these fish and takes it home and washes off the mucus or whatever is stuck to these fish before they cook it, those viruses are going down the drain and depending on the sewage system could be very easily entering watersheds all over. I mean, right from, I don't know, China, United States, here, anywhere this thing goes, they're transporting it. That's why it's so important that this, this virus thing has to become public. Somebody has to really check this out. I, I would suggest the consumer and the stores and the uh, trading partners, because clearly the Canadian government uh, is not going to do anything. I found ISA a lot, and they keep saying that they don't believe my tests. So I'm trying to take it to the next level and actually catch the virus alive. And as far as I'm concerned, once I find these viruses, it's up to somebody else to figure out where these fish came from. So like the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, they can figure out where it came from. They have that ability. Um, you know, they're criticizing me for not having chain of custody, but when people start dying of bacterial outbreaks like Listeria or uh, E. coli, they don't say to the people dying, I'm sorry, we don't know where the, you know, that lettuce or that sausage came from, so, so you're just gonna have to die. No, they find out where it came from, and they can do that in this case too. They're letting us down. I honestly don't know how they could 
not want to follow up on this. These are internationally reportable diseases. There's not that many internationally reportable diseases, about hoof and mouth disease, mad cow disease. Um, these are reportable diseases, and so is infectious salmon anemia. Dealing with farm salmon has made me very concerned about the human food supply. I suggest to people, particularly mothers, buy local stuff. Go look at it. If you can get to know the farmer, great. Um, buy your fish wild. Don't mess with this stuff. Um, we're guinea pigs in a big experiment here, and I'll tell you, they're thinking about their bottom line, not us. Talking to the doctors and nurses that come up to me at my lectures, they say that disease in farm animals is one of the biggest sources of epidemics in humans. And it makes them very uncomfortable that people are eating an influenza virus from a farm animal, and nobody's really checking on it. And then we put them on ice right away, keep everybody cool. When the scientists told me that the best way to preserve a virus is take it down below negative 20, even down to negative 80, I began to wonder about sushi because heat kills the virus, but freezing preserves it. And sushi, as I understand it, is frozen really cold to kill parasites and things like that. But it would be actually preserving the viruses. So uh, I really wanted to find out. So I went to a restaurant and ordered raw salmon, raw farm salmon, and tested it. Okay, thank you very much. Wild salmon, farm salmon. If they don't tell you if it's farmed or wild and you see these big white fat bars, you're dealing with farm salmon. Sockeye is lean and very, very orange and no fat marks. The government says that ISA is not a problem for people, but if they can't find it, they're not, they're not actually looking at it. So I don't know why I should trust them because they're not looking at it. Well, they don't know anything about it. So, you know, we, we want to get a farm salmon so badly out of a farm. We want to get particularly a sick one because those are the ones that you're going to be able to culture the virus out of. And time and time again, I see slow swimmers on the surface. I see guys dipping them out with the uh, nets and putting them into the mort totes. You guys have a disease outbreak? It's so frustrating because they're right there and we can't get them. So we get up to this farm and there's an eagle sitting with one on the edge of a mort tote with Atlantic salmon in its talons. Actually has a fresh mort in its talons, right? And we're like, oh my God, nobody will give us a farm salmon to test. Nobody will give Miller a farm salmon to test. We're like, give it to us. <laughs> Come on, bring it over here. Here, Eagle. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. And so we got closer for a picture, and the Eagle looks around, and he lifts off with the salmon in his talons. And the salmon is so heavy that he's starting to go down, down, down towards the ocean. Drop it. Come on, drop it. Oh my god, follow it. But he makes it into a tree, and then finally he goes onto a rock and another eagle comes down and they start fighting over it. They're like, ah, ah, ah you know, fighting, talons, wings. Got a piece of it. Uh, oh, it's in the water, sorry. Ah, oh, it's sinking. Okay. Jesus Christ. And we're like, let's go, right? And so the boat pulls up and I hop off the bow onto this little islet and uh, there is gill and liver and kidney and flesh and we've got our little sampling kit got the gloves put it right into the kit this was our first and only farm fish that we had chain of custody on we took it home we sent it to dr kabenge and to norway and boom had piscine rio virus it turns out that isa is not the only dangerous european virus that has been introduced into bc salmon Alex and Anissa are now tracking three different introduced exotic viruses of European origin. We found infectious salmon anemia virus, which is the salmon flu. 
and we're finding salmon alpha virus, which causes pancreas disease in salmon and a big problem for the industry in Norway. They have to kill entire farms when they get that. And then this really horrible one called Piscin Rio virus. It, it gives the salmon heart attacks. It weakens the heart muscle. And people I've talked to in Norway don't think a salmon can swim up a river that has this virus. And look at that tissue. Piscine Rio virus, one of the symptoms is a soft heart. This one is uh, very firm, and this heart is extremely soft. This is a classic symptom of Piscine Rio virus, the mushy hearts. A fish with a heart like this, I doubt this fish could go up a big waterfall. And this is what they say in Norway. They say fish with a Piscine Rio virus may not be able to ascend a river. Um, we're seeing these mushy hearts before the rapids out in the ocean but not after Hell's Gate. I don't think these fish can make it through Hell's Gate. The Pacific Salmon Commission says up to 90% of some runs of salmon in some years vanish after Hell's Gate. I wonder if it's something like this. I wonder if it's Piscine Rio virus that's killing a lot of our salmon. The Piscine Rio virus had not been reported in British Columbia before 2010. In less than three years, this newly introduced Norwegian virus has become widespread in fish that are grown in BC waters. Most of the farm salmon Alex tests in the supermarkets are now infected, as well as many of the wild fish. When Piscine Rio virus was first reported in 2010, I was concerned. So we went and we tested 625 fish. We found it in just about every fish that had disease. We found it in healthy fish that were just being ready for transfer. So I decided that I couldn't provide any interpretation for what this meant. And so I decided it probably was not a major concern for our fish. There's this incredibly careless attitude towards the wild fish. It's a huge threat. I mean, these fish are a supreme athlete. Anything that turns their heart to mush, they're not going to be able to dash away from a whale. They're not going to be able to swim through rapids. They're not going to be able to chase down a herring to catch it and eat it. Um, they, they cannot survive unless they are extremely fit. Now, imagine trying to escape <laughs> a killer whale if you've got a heart that's turning to mush. That's what the wild salmon do. When the wild salmon have a disease, they die, and that's how they deal with disease. But the trouble with the situation right now is you got the wild salmon obeying the rules. They're dying, and you got the farms just brewing these things and pouring it out and pouring it out, and it's like an oil spill. It just doesn't seem to end, and the wild fish will never be able to deal with it you know, until the last one's gone. And I have got to wonder if that is, at some level, the intent, because the level of carelessness is unforgivable. We know a lot about salmon, we know a lot about disease, and we know this is wrong. Uh, so it's a difficult battle. I'm tracking these viruses. Uh, I know I'm running up against trade laws, and I keep thinking in the back of my mind, how are they going to stop me? And I get an email from a lawyer. It says, Alex, have you noticed Bill 37? It's coming right at you. And I look up, and uh, I was really appalled. In May 2012, Agriculture Minister Don McRae introduced Bill 37, titled the Animal Health Act, which, if passed, would make it a crime to report information regarding farm animal diseases to the public. What Bill 37 would have done is prevent me from reporting that a salmon picked up in the TNT supermarket or superstore uh, had a particular virus. No one would be able to report if a farm animal from a specific location had a virus. If you find a dangerous disease on these farms, you're not allowed to talk about it. This act brings in some quite repressive measures for people who release information. If somebody working in the system is disturbed by what they see and want to go public, they have to get past the idea that they could be put in jail for doing that. Well, they don't want this information coming out. Um, for whatever reason, I'm not going to speculate about why they don't want it coming out, 
but uh, industry didn't want it coming out and the government sure didn't either. The position of the government and the position of the corporations was almost identical. It's going to fine me $75,000 and two years in prison and two years in prison for naming uh, the location where I found a disease in an animal. Oh yeah, this is, this is their stated intention. We are going to do this. So this is their vision of how they want this to operate. You have to have complete and absolute faith in the people that are guarding this. This was a little bit terrifying because it looked like it was going to pass. You know, everybody's analysis of it was going to pass. It, it felt like Canada was changing. It felt like democracy was, you know, receding. And um, I, I was trying to get legal advice very, very quickly. Like, you know, what do I need to take off my website? Is this going to be law like tomorrow? And, and it was a very disorienting time. But meanwhile, other lawyers, Andrew Gage with West Coast Environmental Law, the head of the Freedom of Information Act, they were writing letters saying, you know what, this is really actually not constitutionally, this government should just really check the legality out of this. And <laughs> Minister McRae basically admitted to that. He said, yeah, it may not be so constitutional, but we can always iron that out later, you know? And, um, and then quietly, for some reason, they just dropped it. It remains on the order paper, so the next time they sit, which is very infrequent, uh, they could pass it. I mean, I think one of the big issues that people need to realize is democracy is slipping away from us. Our ability to protect ourselves, our children, and our homes are being taken away from us right now. And uh, we need to really step up and support our politicians in stopping that. Gates Creek spawning channel, September 10th. High pre-spawn mortality here. These are the lucky survivors. You see these fish pairing up and uh, with their last bit of energy, these fish have come a long way and they dress up in this beautiful regalia just to impress each other, to tell each other what they're gonna give to the next generation and the female and the males make their choice. They're really a generous, generous fish. There's not a lot of species on earth that are built to feed the masses, but salmon are really one of them. And that's the power of these fish. We're here at the invitation of uh, First Nations to test their fish. These guys are concerned. This year they say it's the worst they've ever seen but nobody else is testing for the European viruses, so that's what we're doing. We're doing it ourselves, uh, learning as we go, talking to some of the best people in the vi virology field. We're also gonna train them. So everywhere as we go, we train people so that as the fishery continues, we can keep getting a look at the samples, because we can't be everywhere. And my idea is that wild salmon have to be managed locally, so we have to learn from every fish, look at them, get their story, figure out what their issue is, and try to work with the animal rather than just guess. But my hope is that we can build a local lab so these folks take a sample, you know, send it down, everybody do it the same way, and that way you're really going to get a look at the whole coast and figure out exactly what's going on with these fish. We have trained uh, commercial fishermen out on their fish boats and First Nations and stream keepers, wilderness tourism operators. And in that way, we ourselves are going to monitor what's going on. We, the people of British Columbia. It's time for people to realize that if we want wild salmon, it is up to us. This is a huge, huge issue. And there's no reason for us to lose these fish. People are willing to work. We have the science to turn this around. The fish are incredibly resilient. There's, there's enormous ocean production going on right now. Some runs are doing extremely well. I, I, I don't see any reason to lose wild salmon. Uh, I think wild salmon is probably the, one of the best things we could do for our economy because they, they create wealth in communities as they go. Life 
in British Columbia, the people, the, the wilderness, the environment, which is coming in and out of our bodies, all that benefits from wild salmon. So it probably runs into billions of dollars that are coming into this province every time these fish come in from the ocean. The corporate food production system is a big experiment that is not really going all that well. So, you know, people should realize this whole system makes food. These fish come back to us for free. This benefits our economy. This keeps us alive. This makes food at a level that boggles the mind. It's huge. If we just worked with these fish, we could have them back to enormous numbers. I have no doubt every time we give them a break, they come back. Government has no way of recognizing that wealth. They have no way of responding to that wealth because it's not owned. It belongs to us. And that's why protection of wild salmon has to be us, it has to be the Department of Wild Salmon, which is us. The next step is really for all of us who care about the fish to become the Department of Wild Salmon and look after these fish ourselves. And I think if you went back to society and the people working on these fish said, you know what, we're losing 5% of the fish here, 4%, 10% here, but here we're losing 90%, I think society would say, oh, well, let's see if we can fix that. And government just becomes somebody you go to and say, hey guys, here's the plan. I see enormous potential to bring these fish back. I think we could totally turn this coast back on. Everywhere you go, virtually every spawning ground, probably in British Columbia, there's somebody who's already there checking on it, watching over it. That is what's so powerful. The relationship between humans and the fish is strong, and they know they need each other. I mean, we have become part of the biology of wild salmon, without a doubt. And we're either going to see them go down or we're going to keep them alive. Uh, so we're here in Boston Bar, and um, Tamara's decided that she's willing to take samples for us, and so we're training her. So that means as we wander on and, and sample other fish, she'll be here to watch over the fish that come through her area. And uh, people that find fish that are diseased, yellow or red speckles or whatever they're concerned about, can give her a call. She can take the samples and then get them to us, and then we send the samples on to Norway and Prince Edward Island. This is our idea of the Department of the Wild Salmon. It's, it's us. It's the people that are on the grounds, uh, that know the fish. Uh, we're the ones that we should be doing the work. This is the Department of the Wild Salmon, us. The people who want wild salmon in British Columbia, we are the Department of Wild Salmon.